Hey there, I'm Kayla Phillips, and you're about to watch my interview with June Millington, presented by New Music Alliance. Hello, everyone. I'm Kayla, and I'm here with the rock and roll legend, June Millington. Welcome, June, and thank you for meeting with us today. So the Essential Western New England Songbook is a collection of the best songs ever written and recorded by artists who have lived in Western New England and whose careers have a significant con a significant connection to the area. A wide variety of music industry professionals from all over Western New England have contributed to nominations to this ever-growing compilation of songs, including June herself. So June, how do you feel about having your song, Play Like a Girl, being recognized as one of the best original songs recorded by a Western New England artist? Well, I feel great about it. Hi there. <laughs> Um, and I have to agree. I have to agree that it is one of the best songs. I'm, I'm surprised it hasn't been picked up more because it, it says uh, so much of women and girls is truth. You know, come on, come on and rock the world. If they tell you you can't do it, you just turn it up and play like a girl. That's right. You know, I mean, you can't get closer uh, to the bone than that, mm -hmm. you know. Turn up and play like a girl. It's tongue in cheek, but everybody knows exactly what I mean. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, yeah. After coming to California from the Philippines, how did you find yourself here in Western New England? Well, my dad was from Vermont, so okay. I guess I have it in my <gasps> DNA. I, you know, I fell in love with Ann, and she was uh, running the Women's Center at Hampshire College. That was in... Uh, 84 when we got together and you know what I just had to be with her and so I moved in with her and uh, for a couple of years and then we went to California as we founded IMA although we were driving all around the country to do benefits mm -hmm. but IMA was basically um, convened in Northern California with myself and Ann, uh, Angela Davis, uh, Roma Barron who produces um, Lori Anderson. So uh, we were there until um, I think around 2000 and 2001, we moved here to Goshen, which as you know, is uh, more towards Pittsfield, the other side of Northampton. So, um, and we love it here. It's, it's actually, you know, the best place for us to be 25 acres, the house, two barns. Wow. Uh, as you probably know, we've converted the barn to be a performance center and it's where we do our rock and roll girls camps. Plus, we have two recording studios. So it's a, really a million dollar facility. That's amazing. Uh, when you get down to it. Mm -hmm. That's top notch. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you say you admire most or appreciate most about the music scene out here? Well, um, it's always happening, number one. I mean, you're never going to run, run out of people who are doing it full bore, you know, and the girls from our camps are one example, you know, uh, some of the, some of the bands that came out of here are, and the kids who defunct it. And there are, of course, um, you know, many, uh, solo acts, but Isabella De Hurt with high T right now. Um, so but, you know, regardless of that, there are just endless bands and endless creativity. There are a lot of players and songwriters out here. And mm -hmm. I, I find that really um, inspiring. Although I will say that when we first moved here in 2001, we closed right before 9-11, actually. Um, I, it, it, I found the scene to be completely different because actually the approach to music is different. It's, um, it, ha it has a real folk edge to it you know no matter what genre it is it has that uh folk edge and in california you know i mean you got your oakland funk there's nothing like oakland funk out here mm -hmm. that i can recognize you know so and in la very much the you know the rock and roll thing when we got there when we got to la in 68 69 uh that thing was just really hitting. So that was what I was used to. And that's kind of what I'm known for. So to come here and to sink into the folk scene was uh, a little bit disorienting for me. It's a completely different approach to, to music. But 
you know, my grandmother was from Vermont and upstate New York, and she was an archivist. She, in fact, Pete Seeger got all the songs for his first album from Marjorie Porter. So that is also with my DNA, you know. Um, yeah. That's kind of a long answer. No, so, that's hard. okay. Uh, long answers are perfectly fine. Um, <laughs> Totally, yeah. Um, so you spoke a bit about the IMA. Um, so our viewers had a chance to see and hear a little bit about the IMA, aka the Institute for the Musical Arts, um, which you and your partner Anne had founded here in Western New England, as you said, in Goshen, Massachusetts. Um, the IMA has since grown into an internationally known teaching, performing, and recording facility, supporting young women in music and music-related business. Um, could you tell me a bit about what the IMA means to you? Well, I mean, it's it's inseparable from my inner being. You mm -hmm. know, it really is. You know, <laughs> it, to to look at the long view, it's my personal vision quest. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you get parity in the universe and bring it down to the world in the U.S.? How do you get parity? in the music business. Um, it's been very difficult for me and really to tell the truth that the only reason I've stayed in is because it's my vision quest. It's music is is um, at the center of everything, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and part of the reason why I exist is I started hearing voices in 1976. I'm very kind of that that type. I have that Philippine healer kind kind of vibe and reality actually so i'm very connected to my ancestors and they have sent me in the last 10 years several messages one of them started out through psychics one of them started with we are your ancestors uh we sent you here we're very proud of you wow. <laughs> so that gives me, yeah that gives me the you know a continued sort of courage and sus inner sustenance to continue the work because to found something like uh, IMA was a crazy idea, but it wasn't my idea. It was the voices of my ancestors. So they came through in 76 briefly. And then in 86, when I was with them, and actually more of them came in and they started to come to me in my dreams. So actually the reason why Angela Davis was involved is because I was talking to her in San Francisco around 86. And I said, you know, I told her about these voices and I said, I, you know, I don't know what to do. And she said, well, get started. And I'm like, what? Me? I, I'm not an organizer. But she said the only thing that could have got me going, which was, well, they're talking to you. Mm -hmm. End of story right there. You, you know, she just really pointed out that very simple fact. They're talking to you. So get going. Then, you know, I'm sure Angela Davis didn't want to go to jail and almost be murdered by the FBI and do the incredible things she's done in her life, you know. I mean, she certainly accepted it. So I accept I may as part of my spiritual life, my ongoing, uh, because I do believe in reincarnation. So it's my ongoing karma, really. I was meant to do this like I was meant to be in Fanny and to do rock and roll and to write songs to take on the hardships really of this crazy idea, which most people told me and Anne, hey, you can't do that. That's just too big. You know, cause our, our mission statement was really, it was like 16 pages and then we, then we narrowed it down to four. We sent it to people, we showed it to people, gigs and, and so forth. And most people, most people said, I don't think you can do this. It's too big. But you know, we just got, went ahead and got started. <clears throat> Excuse me, as we, and so we got our nonprofit status, I think, 87 or something like that. And we moved into IMA West, which was in Bodega, California, I think 1990 or 91. And within two years, I had this personal mantra. We do what we can, when we can. That really narrowed my own personal mission statement because I was getting frustrated. I, I wanted to just, you know, sort of attack all these ideas. But I also realized by being in women's music that I had seen so many organizations or even a coffee shop or a bookstore where people could play implode under trying to build the vision too fast. And um, 
I, you know, Anna and I decided together, no, we're going to make sure that this lasts because this is generational. We're passing it on to the next generations, plural, you know. So you have to protect it from your own too much visioning sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, because it can actually absolutely just just fall um, and you don't even notice it, you know. Mm -hmm. So the first few years are basically taking this young child making sure you have enough food water shade etc you know and we hardly had any money but you know when you have an imperative such as ima you just make it happen you just make it happen wow okay i love that answer <laughs> that that's great <laughs> by the way i want a copy of this <laughs> Oh, of course, you'll you'll get yeah, it. Yeah, sure. archive. See, that's the other thing. I think partly because my grandmother, Marjorie Porter, was a real archivist. I think I had that in me. So I feel like, well, especially when I was younger, I'm 73 now, but let's say my 50s, 60s, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, I videoed everything because mm -hmm. I just, I, I just felt like I needed to grab life where I could. And so the IMA archives are really incredible. I have dinners at the dinner table, you know, at, in Bodega. I have concerts, sound checks, you name it, I've got it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important that future generations get to see us as we are now, not the public projection, which is, of course, real. But mm -hmm. there's a lot of real stuff behind that. Right. So. Well, the archives are really important so that future generations can see us as we are mm -hmm. and they can take part, they can take notice and they can see how hard it is. I mean, life never really gets, uh, you know, it, it isn't really that different from generation to generation. It actually doesn't get better except that you've changed your position and how you get hurt. <laughs> you know, we're playing like a girl. We get back to that. We get back to that. So... With that being said, what would you, what would you say is the most fulfilling part about the IMA? I know you said that, you know, it's it was essentially your mission, like your life's mission to create such a thing. What is the most fulfilling part about it for you? You know, that changes with time. Mm -hmm. Right now, the part that I find fulfilling is is this actually it's turned into the resource center that it was meant to be. For example, we have girls from camps all the time coming here to rehearse. Or yesterday, uh, Isabella DeHert, who came to our very first preteen and is now graduated from college and has her duo, High Tea, she uh, uh, videoed her uh, their entry for Tiny Desk yesterday here in our barn. No way. So That's girls from awesome. camp, yeah, girls from camp can just say, hey, can I come to the barn? Is anything happening? You know, so they rehearse here. They do all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I really love that because it's, it's comfortable. We've been around for so long that these girls can just pick up the phone or write us an email and say, hey, is it okay if I come over, dot, 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 or, you know, whatever they need. We try to, we're kind of, in a Buddhist sense, a wish fulfilling gem. <laughs> okay. Um, and that's happening naturally. That's not anything we're trying to force. It's just happening every week, you know? So I like that part of it. And so that's really different from, you know, 1992, where we were just trying to get people to know about IMA and to somehow step into the frame that we'd set up of, you know, trying to help women and girls and music for all of time. Well, that's big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? So we just learn step by step doing what we can when we can. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I love how your mantra comes full circle here. <laughs> <laughs> it's all um, full circle. Full it's circle. all full circle. Yes. Um, so, of course, for you and your sister, Jean, your big break was essentially with your band, Fanny. Um, considering the challenges that Fanny faced as an all-female um, rock band in the 70s, of course, um, what advice would you give to the aspiring female musicians in the Western New England area? Uh, first, let me say that uh, Fanny did not start out as a rock band. So, like right there, there's an example of because Hollywood demanded it, they 
basically pointed us more towards rock and roll. We were more or less a, a pop funk band. Um, and I liked that. And I, I kind of resented being forced into rock and roll, but I learned how to do it. And now I'm really known for that. You know, that's from a branding standpoint, Fanny is known as rock and roll, but we really uh, came in with a, a bright, a, a much wider uh, spectrum than that. That mm -hmm. being said, you know, you've got to be able to um, basically make the changes, you know, learn how to stumble and fail because it's mostly going to be failure mm -hmm. uh, from my standpoint now looking back. You know, now it looks like a success. Wow, Fanny's known all over the world and there's a documentary and all that. But uh, we had to learn how to take everything in stride and keep going. I think that's really important because in this culture you know kids are told that you can do anything you want and you can be anything well uh, sure that's that's the truth you know in, in a in a sort of overarching sense but we're not uh conditioned to accept failure which mm -hmm. is that you can't learn everything all at once <laughs> mm -hmm. it can't be done so mm -hmm. it's a process and so try to step back and forth between learning who you are. By the way, our frontal lobes don't even fuse to the age 25, okay? Mm -hmm. So how old are you? I'm 22. I'm not even there yet. <laughs> exactly. So we think that we're adults now at 17, 18 or something like that. And it's too much. It's mm -hmm. too much. So learn how to have patience, how to have gratitude. Gratitude is actually the key to so much, mm -hmm. you know, gratitude that you could fail and pick yourself up again. Gratitude that there are people around you to whom you can ask questions. I mean, look, mm -hmm. I'm half Filipina. I'm half deaf. I always have been. Okay. I knew nothing when we got here, except Jean and I played ukuleles and we played a little acoustic guitar when we got here in 1961. How do you go from that? to being on 25 acres and being the artistic director of IMA and being sort of famous for be, having been in Fanny, although Fanny is not my only colleague card, but okay, there it is. That has to do with branding. So I have to accept even that. In some way, I resent the whole Fanny branding thing because a lot of people don't know how much I've written in my life. You know, I think they'll discover maybe when I'm gone. But that's part of my legacy. So there's, it's such a big ball of wax. And I talk about this at our camps with the girls, you know. Um, there's no way they can actually learn everything we're trying to present them with every day, that much information. So you mm -hmm. gotta try, you gotta do it again, over and over and over. Repetition is the key. And also telling our stories is really important, mm -hmm. you know. Because I think, I think a lot of women and girls can take heart from my own personal story, which is most of my life, I've been broke. <laughs> you know, I've never earned a lot of money from doing music, but I'm rich, rich in the sense that I'm fulfilled. And yeah. uh, I know I've done my job and that's really, that really counts for, I mean, everything really. You know, how do you keep your nose above the water? I mean, it's trial and error, you've got to, pick up your courage and face the next day, whether it's an amazing time or song or show or a new chord you learned or whatever, right? I mean, a new friend is going to be in your band or your duo, all that stuff. Fantastic. Your world is expanding too. Oh my God, what did we just do? Why didn't that work? Mm -hmm. you know? And for us, when we first started out in our band, The Svelts, Nobody taught us how to be in a band. What? Girls in a band? You know, so we had to learn ourselves. And what we did was we were learning songs off the radio that were hits. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you know, back in the day, in the 60s, the song came out on Monday, was heard by Wednesday, and we were playing it at, at an Air Force base on Saturday. Okay. Wow. That's how fast. And everybody knew the words. Wow, uh, yeah. You know, my girl, for example, I give you that, my girl. I mean, it was... It just took over the world. Or do you believe in magic? It's like that. Mm -hmm. But we, our criteria was, did people jump on the dance floor to dance? That was our thing. And if they did that, we knew 
we were doing a good job and we mm -hmm. kept learning more and more, you know. Apples, peaches, pumpkin pie. A lot of people don't even know that song now, but that's a, a great tune. Um, uh, Rescue Me by Fontella Bass. I mean, a lot of songs that we cut our teeth on, people don't even remember now, but they were incredible. Walking the Dog by Rufus Thomas. We must have done that a couple hundred times. Uh, Midnight Hour, people still kind of know that song. Uh, you know, Land of a Thousand Dances, which is why, why my book is called, my autobiography is called Land of a Thousand Bridges. It's a play on that. I mean, every time we start, na, 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 people just would rush to the dance floor. Mm -hmm. And everyone felt so good. I didn't feel racism right then. I never felt racism when people were dancing. And they didn't either. All different ages and colors and, you know, they just were doing it. They were happy and we were happy. Magic happens when you do music a certain way, when you're totally open with it. And music is totally the key. It's totally mm -hmm. the key. And there is no culture that doesn't have music that expresses uh, feelings that like in the Caribbean tells the latest news, <laughs> mm. you know, that's a lot of what uh, music does in some countries is it tells you the latest what's going on. Um, it's everything. There is no culture that ha that doesn't have music. That's okay. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no matter any background, what you think, what you look like, like everybody loves music. It's hard to not love music and music really does bring us together. As you said, it doesn't matter what you were playing. People were dancing if they liked the beat. Yeah, I mean, if you don't have that music and the joy that goes with it, you're not sort of dancing with the cosmos. And that's not necessarily said, but people feel that all the time. You want to dance in your complete joy. And there are ways to do that. And music is one of the main keys. Mm -hmm. It's really incredible. I'm so thankful for my life and the fact that I was, you know, led by my ancestors to do what I have done and that I still continue doing. I mean, my latest album, Snapshots, which is available through IMA, by the way, IMA.org, is really, it's really an incredible album. It has two songs from Way in My Past, and it has songs that I recorded uh, last year. And it has songs that I started, like, say, in 2012, 2013, where I had girls sing on the track, and then finally it all came together, and I made myself put it out, because it's a lot of work, you know. Mm -hmm. put out an album I just the mastering itself I don't know if you know what mastering is but it's the final touch you know before, right. before we bring the book out so it was a lot of work but um it's what I'm led to do you know and and people are starting to order uh snapshots is the name of the album it's snapshots of me and my musical existence you know and it music means the world to me it is everything it is central to my being it's it's not only my core it's everybody's core so music connects me to everyone ev everything uh i i feel it i i don't need to know you you know what i'm saying i already knew you in some way because you're you're con we're connected through music and that's it's the music of the universe really wow um yeah before um, we wrap up the interview, as you were saying, you have your um, next album coming out called Snapshots, um, in which many of the songs recorded here in Western New England at IMA, is that correct? Yes. Okay. We have actually we have two recording studios in the barn. Wow. That I mean, is. When I say it's a million dollar facility, I kid you not. Wow. Wow. Yeah, we have an SSL board uh donated by berkeley school of music and it just goes on and on i mean it's really a fantastic tale but it's all true mm. mm -hmm. um would you mind telling our viewers uh where or how they can listen to the album once it does come out sure well you can order it through ima just go to the website ima.org mm -hmm. and there's a pop down menu uh snapshots i mean right now that is the best way you can order it the mp3s for 10 bucks order the cd for 15 dollars, or just stop by and get it all right <laughs> for me. For us, Goshen, why wait just stop by all right we're actually available <laughs> <laughs> that's too funny um but, uh, 
<laughs> well, great. Thank you so much for meeting with me today. And um, you guys make sure that you get your hands on snapshots. Thank you for watching this interview with June Millington. And thank you, June, for taking the time to speak with me. We are so thrilled to have you as our Artist Spotlight this week. For more interviews on artists who have been featured in the Western New England Songbook, visit our website at www.newmusicalliance.org. Until next time.